Chapter 3 Ten Days in a Rowing Boat to Saint Louis. So here I was at last, somewhere here, the huge estate of the rubber magnet of the Rio Branco, Senor R, must begin. No one knew exactly how big this immense piece of land was, nor were its limits marked by any stone or fence. In the half-light I made out a spacious hut, without walls and covered with palm leaves, a raised building with its floor about three feet above the ground. A young Brazilian from the state of Para lived here with his wife and child. He was, so to speak, the gatekeeper of the Saint Louis rubber estate. It was his duty to check who came into the river and who passed out of it. He took the mail for Saint Louis, which was delivered as occasion offered by a government boat or a passing trader. In a word, he was the link with the outside world for the rubber depot of Saint Louis, which lay deep in the jungle. By the light of a paraffin lamp, he spelled out the letter of introduction which his employer had given me. Muito bem, he said. When it's light, you can have your luggage taken into the house. The crew of the steamer were loading a pile of long logs. It was morning before the job was finished. At an improvised altar, one of the missionaries read Mass, for it was Ascension Day. Then the Joka sounded the signal for departure and struggled on upstream. Shall I have to wait a long time to transport to Saint Louis? I asked, turning to Amando, for that was the name of the custodian of the place. You're lucky, he yawned. In a week, at the outside, I expect the motor boat from up there. Of course, the boat will stay here for the boss, but the crew will take the rowing boat back. And how long does it take upriver? I should hardly think more than ten days with the water at this level. But that depends on the culture and also on whether the river goes down quickly. We've already had no rain for some days now. I had often heard about the culture. It is a firm, floating layer of decaying wood, swamp grass, and all kinds of water plants, which spreads in profusion over the tributaries of the Guapur, particularly in the dry season, but frequently in the rainy season as well, and often holds up boats for days. Waiting at the mouth of the Rio Branco became torture, Incessantly, day and night, I had to battle with swarms of mosquitoes, but I couldn't spend the whole time under the net, and from the ground the columns of little red fire ants hurrying indefat indefatigably this way and that launched their attacks and had soon conquered all my baggage. Just look at my little boy, complained Mondo's young wife. He's been bitten from head to foot by mosquitoes, and the formiga de fogo. But what can we do? Poor people must earn their living somehow. But Amondo did not seem to have to earn his living with as much difficulty as all that when he did not happen to be keeping an eye on the fishing lines, which he had cast in the river. He would be lying in his hammock. His employer had sent him two Indian boys to assist, and they did all the work for the white man. Not that he was so very white. They felled trees and chopped them up into firewood, which Amondo sold on his own account to the steamers which went past. They helped in catching fish, 
which when he had salted and sun-dried them, he easily disposed of to the passengers, and it was not hard to guess who would tap the liquid rubber in the surrounding estados and shape it into bales day after day during the dry season. Where do the boys come from? I asked him. One is a makara, and the bigger one a tupari. A tupari, but I was told that the tupari were a wild tribe of cannibals. Oh yes, they are, but they come to St. Louis from time to time, and this boy never went back to his tribe. He stayed in the Baracato and, and was given the name Jordao. He has been working here at the mouth of the river for two years. Couldn't I take him along with me, I pleaded, to guide me to his fellow tribesmen. Now, now, that won't do at all, he says, an old sorcerer. will kill and eat him. He doesn't want to go back again. But there are four or five more young Tupari in Salouy. One of them even accompanied the travelers to his tribe. Travelers? Yes, a rider from Buenos Aires with his wife, a woman doctor and a student. They were here only a short time and went on to Salouy. That was at the end of February, if I remember rightly. In the meantime, they are supposed to have got as far as the Tupari. They'll probably be back again soon. This must have been the journalist and his party whom the bishop at the Guajara mission had mentioned to me. At last, the motorboat came down from the rubber depot with a small cargo of Brazil nuts. Yes, we must allow at least ten days, the newcomers confirmed. The river is still flowing very strongly, and the bateldo is much too heavy for four men. On May 11th, we said set out. At the improvised helm sat a Bolivian rubber gatherer whom the manager had put in charge of the little party. Of the three rowers, one hailed from Peru, the second had come up here from somewhere in the Amazonas, and the third, the only native, was a taciturn Indian lad of Makurup blood. Compared with the Mamor and Guapor, the Rio Branco looks no more than a largish brook, but in the rainy season it overflows its banks deep into the forest, puts out to right and left large subsidiary arms, and is so deep that in the heyday of the rubber trade the company's river steamers used to ply with perfect safety up to well past Salouy. Slowly the tall jungle glided past us. The oars splashed in a soporific rhythm. First, we would hug the right bank, then the left according to the current. Then the river took us out of the forest into a huge flooded savanna. Small groups of trees and the tips of the high grasses peeped out of the water and marked the way until we plunged into the forest again. When the sun had disappeared, we reached a pascana, or camping ground. When the stream runs high, only a few places are suitable for spending the night, but the rowers knew every inch of the way, and where a stranger's eye would have noticed nothing, the peculiar shape of a tree or the type of bushes showed them a place where we could pass at night. We spread our hammocks and ate a little rice with dried meat and drank black coffee. The rowers were exhausted by their work, and I had been tired out. 
by the brooding sun. So we soon slipped under our mosquito nets. Only a very short time could have passed. However, when a vigorous snarling roused me unceremoniously from my sleep, a jaguar, I exclaimed in a muffled voice to wake my companions. Anka Nado smiled the Bolivian drowsily. Jacari Vejo de Nado. Not a jaguar, but an old caiman, a crocodile. It had probably been watching us for some time from the bank. Now he was giving voice to his anger, because no one had yet run into his jaws. We had no rifle, but there was no danger that the monster would drag us from our hammocks. The rubber gatherers knew all about the habits of these creatures. It's only sleeping on the ground, which is dangerous, said the Peruvian soothingly. Last summer, a caiman attacked a couple sleeping on the banks of the Guapur. He seized the man and tried to drag him to the river. The man woke up shouted and struggled to get free. If his wife hadn't come to his help, the caiman would certainly have dragged him right off. As it was, he merely tore off his arm and the man escaped alive. But the young Amazonian grew uneasy. Give me a couple of cartridges with large shot, he asked me. We only need to tickle the old gentleman a bit. Then he'll go and more and snore somewhere else. With my torch in one hand and the shotgun in the other, he made his way through the undergrowth to the shallow bank. I groped my way along behind him. Look, there, there, the three small bumps, that's the head, whispered the lad excitedly and took aim. A report broke the silence and the monster vanished in the dark waters. With this shot, the whole jungle seemed to awaken. Night birds and bats flitted through the air. Crickets chirped and whistled like locomotives. In the nearby river, fishes were leaping about, and a pack of night apes swung, squeaking and squealing through the branches. The embers of the campfire lit up the bushes, with a dull glow, and our hammocks and mosquito nets looked like ghost ships floating through the night air. Aren't there any jaguars here then? Now and then the clearing of a throat revealed to me that my companions had not yet gone off to sleep either. In the rainy season they move inland to higher ground. What could they possibly do here? Everything is flooded. Answered the Bolivian, but you have to look out in the dry season. A lot of people have been attacked by them. Nonsense contradicted the Amazonian vigorously. No jaguar will attack a human being sleeping under a mosquito net. Have it your own way, but jaguars who are after human flesh, will drag you off, mosquito net and all. Thank heavens they don't all go after human flesh. A dull rolling like the thunder of a distant storm interrupted us. Is it going to rain? I listened anxiously. We had no tent and the prospect of a tropical storm was far from tempting. No, no, that is the roar of a hungry anaconda. These water snakes, often more than 30 feet long, are insatiable. Wild boars, young tapirs, stags, human beings, and even smallish caimans are devoured by them. Being attacked by a jaguar wouldn't worry me so much, but to be crushed by a succoral, succory, the Peruvian shuddered, and have all my bones cracked and through sheer fright not even be able to cry out. No, I shouldn't like to die that way. About 3 a.m., the Bolivian woke us. 
We take advantage of the cool of the morning, he warned us, and stirred up the fire. We can then rest a bit at midday. No one can stand the confounded heat. The rowers muttered sleepily. Only when the scent of hot coffee assailed their nostrils did they rather crossly get up. Once again we traveled for hours through the dark forest. Every bend of the river offered the same prospect. Towering giants of the jungle, slender palms, a tangle of lianas, and impenetrable bush. Above us, a clear, starry sky. When we emerged from the forest into the broad savanna, the rowers looked for the southern cross. A shooting star fell. Have a wish, senor. Don't you know that whatever you wish, when that happens, will come true? Days, day began to dawn. We moored and cooked our breakfast. At midday, too, <clears throat> we had a good rest, but the brooding sun had driven away our appetite. On and on, we went up the huge bends of the Rio Bronco. It was late at night before we again reached a dry spot on the bank. While I was balancing over the side, I slipped and fell with a splash into the water. Come out quickly, cried the Bolivian impatiently. Don't you know that there are a lot of piranhas round here? You can very quickly have a piece bitten off. In a trice, I was standing on dry ground again. I knew these predatory little fish. With their razor-sharp teeth, they can tear a man or an animal to pieces in a few minutes. For three more days, we rode up the river in this way. A few river dolphins accompanied, accompanied us, putting their noses out of the water, puffing into the air, and diving under again in a graceful arc. Here and there, the keen eyes of my companions made out the bumps on the snout and the bulging eyes of a crocodile. A huge flock of birds bustled about on the river and the flooded savanna. Wild duck and other web footed creatures looked for food on solitary tree storks and smaller on sm solitary trees storks and smaller long beaked waterfowl were swinging and at every bend we put up forest birds of various kinds not a day passed without one of the rowers shooting one or two wild ducks thus we did not have to resort to our dried fish which was already swarming with maggots. If the sun beat down too hotly, we rested in the shade of the bank. The sack of farinha was produced, and a chibe was mixed with water and sugar. This tastes like sweetened water with sawdust, but one grows used to it. In addition, we nibbled roasted corn cobs and ground nuts and cracked Brazil nuts. My companions talked almost incessantly. The Bolivian and Peruvian spoke Portuguese almost better than Spanish, for they had been working in Brazil for years, and whenever bachelors are talking, the one inevitable and inexhaustible talk it, topic arises sooner or later, women. Our boat was no exception. The rowers vied with each other in accounts of their adventures, exchanging experiences, and the eventful past as well as the present mode of life of the few women in the jungle were discussed with little respect or discretion. I say, Peruano, own up, you're after little Justina, or who do you get a bottle of scent for from the store every Saturday. There hasn't been any scent in St. Louis for a long time, and in any case Justina is no great catch. Her old man only wants to do business with her. These damned Indians have got even more artful than we have. I don't intend to go the same way as Valorado. 
The lads burst into roars of laughter. What happened to Velarado? Oh, he gave Justina's father a gun in exchange for his daughter, but the Indian had scarcely got the gun when the daughter ran away from Velardo. Now he's got no gun and no wife. And the Indian's laughing fit to burst. He'll probably be offering his daughter to some other mug any day now. The government interferes in everything these days. After all, they could order every employer to keep a brothel for the workers. Then we shouldn't need to go after our neighbor's wives or haggle with an Indian for his ugly daughter. Why, there are brothels in the big cities, and that's the best proof there is that there's nothing immoral about it. What good would that be? How long do you think the girls would stay in the brothels? Not even a fortnight. Then they'd each have their lover. And what about the other chaps who'd be left out in the cold? The best thing would be for everyone to have a wife of his own. But what girl would go to a poor Seriguero in the forest to live with jaguars and wild boar? The girls want to stay in their own villages go to the pictures once a week, and suck their ice cream. If anyone wants to take them away, it'll have to, it will have to be to Rio de Janeiro, at least. Even Manoa's isn't good enough for them, and you're suggesting they should go with a rubber gatherer into the jungle. Don't make me laugh. On the fifth day of our journey, we reached a human settlement, Moro, Palado, or Bald Hill, three raised huts inhabited by Indians who belonged to the labor force of the rubber company. We leapt ashore beside a carpenter's hut and a primitive sugarcane press, the flesh of a freshly killed tapir was steaming on a grid. Boa Tard, said Alfredo, the chief, by way of greeting, and put down his chopper. He was busy repairing one of his master's boats. Several women were sitting on the ground. They came up hesitantly and shook hands with me. Alfredo pointed disparagingly at one of them. This is my wife, an Indian. My parents were also Indians, but I am a civilized caboclo. Alfredo gave himself airs. He was an Indian from the Rio Maquena or Corumbiara, but had learnt the carpenter's trade years before in Guajara. I've worked in Guajara and Bolivia, he continued proudly, and I also learned Spanish there. However, he could not read or even write. His house was in an even worse plight. It was the dirtiest and most untidy I had set eyes on during the whole trip. In utter confusion, there lay, stood, or hung in his kitchen, arrows, bows, guns, ragged clothes, baskets, birds' feathers, empty tens of all sizes, calabashes, boar skins, a jaguar's skin, earthenware pots and bowls, imported enamel plates, fresh and dried meat, swarming with flies, mandioca, roots, papas, bananas, a pile of ground nuts, galoshes, a battered chamber pot, eggshells, and fish bones, an old suitcase, a bucket, grimy oil bottles, and amid all this evil-smelling jumble, I discovered my own cutlery and plates, which the thoughtful Indian lad had brought up for the meal, which was about to be served. We stayed in Moro Palado 
over Sunday, we had completed half our journey. The rowers had richly earned a day's rest and more plentiful food. The Cablocos never go hungry, said the Bolivian, chewing away. They always have something good to eat in their fields, but we white folk are lazy good for nothings. We wait for farinha to be brought to us from Para and tend goods from Rio de Janeiro or even from North America. These Indians seem very good natured fellows. I brushed a swarm of flies from my plate. They're not always good natured, the Bolivian corrected me. Look at Esteban, for example, the one with the fat belly and the friendly grin, the pretty young woman over there in the flowered red dress is his wife. The dress came from a fellow countryman of mine, and he is dead. What happened? Oh, it's quite simple. My fellow countryman ran after Esteban's wife and took her off into his coloco. Esteban said nothing. We were beginning to think he had forgotten his wife. But then one day he went into the hut, and my fellow countryman, with his bow and arrow, the latter had no time to load his rifle. He ran out the door and tried to get away. Esteban raised his bow and put an arrow in his back. The other man fell. Esteban fired two more arrows right through him, fetched his wife from the hut, and took her along with him. What could we do about it? We pulled out the arrows and buried him. On the Monday, we set off again in our boat from Moro Palato. Once more, the monotonous rowing began. Look over there, and Uba is coming, cried the helmsman, staring up, starting up. A long canoe was making its way slowly downstream towards us. It was the little party of explorers whom I had believed to be still in the depths of the jungle with the savages. The journalist with his wife and their two companions as well as an Indian from Saloui whom they had taken as guide. Both boats tied up. Greetings were exchanged, and the travelers told us about their trek through the jungles on the upper Rio Branco. They had actually reached the Tupari and had brought thirty bearers with them from there. These were now working in San Luis and already knew that another Dutour was on his way to them. After an hour, we exchanged farewells. The canoe vanished downstream, and we rowed on against the current. On both sides, tall jungle day after day. Again and again, we passed settlements of rubber, rubber gatherers. Everywhere, they were preparing for the harvest. Then, on the afternoon of the 21st of May, we at last sighted our goal. On the bank lay a few canoes. A flight of steps made of stout planks led up the steep slope. Above it rose a large building, scantily plastered over with reddish clay. Chapter 4 A First Greeting from the Naked Men I climbed the steps at the top stood a well-built young man with fair wavy hair and energetic blue eyes guten tag er angel i greeted him in german and we exchanged a warm handshake delighted to see you we've been expecting you for a long time your letter and the letter of introduction from the boss arrived three weeks ago I was beginning to think you had got lost. Ongol made a sign to the rowers who came panting up from the river with my baggage. 
You must be dying for a meal, he said, turning to me again. The cook will prepare something right away, but you will have to make shift with the little there is. At the moment, we are passing through the seven lean years. We climbed three steps and went into the building. Excuse me a moment. I'll just see to things in the kitchen. Do make yourself comfortable in the hammock meanwhile. I had time to take stock of my new surroundings. I was in a large barn with walls of primitive framework and a roof of palm leaves, the whole intersected by a few party walls, which just about divided off two rooms, a kitchen, a corner for writing, the shop, and a few storerooms. The living rooms were provided with floors of rough split palm trunks, which bent backwards and forwards at every step. The floors of the other apartments were of beaten earth. All the rooms were open to the roof, and the windows nailed up with wire netting or a piece of tulle. This was the Baracal, the administrative building of the Rio Branco rubber concern, a kingdom comprising heaven knows how many square miles and containing a fortune running into millions in the shape of natural rubber scarcely yet touched, Brazil nuts, valuable species of wood, and medicinal plants. The rowers stacked my baggage along the wall. Appetizing scents began to waft through the open door. I ate my meal in the sooty kitchen, where a small, plump Bolivian woman was busy at the flickering hearth fire. An Indian boy served the meal, eyed me critically, and then went on peeling and cutting up large tubers. At the window, two parrots were performing gymnastics, screeching unintelligible words and laughing. Ongol inquired about his acquaintances in Guajara and how my journey had passed off. There was a lot to tell him, but I had other things of closer concern to me to talk of. Are the Tupari still here, or have they vanished into their forest again? Never fear, they're still here, and I hope they stay a long time yet answered the Swabian. Just at the moment, they are away over the river to harvest the rice, but you will meet them tonight. And what's the best way to get on with them? You can soon see that for yourself. They are very nice fellows indeed, and talk about work. If they hadn't come along at the right time, I should be in a bad way. There's always too much work and too few people here. How many Tupari are there here, then? Thirty, and that seems to be almost all that's left of the tribe. The Tupari must have gone down terribly in numbers of recent years, but Senor Regino will be able to tell you more about that. He is, so to speak, the father of the Salawi Indians. Besides, he has himself visited the Maloka of the Tupari. He's an important man for you to see. If you get on well with him and Alfredo, then you can't go wrong. And who is Alfredo? A sort of foreman on our plantations, a Makurup Indian the son of a chief and sorcerer, who was greatly feared. You need a caboclo like Alfredo if you want to have dealings with the Indians. The likes of us can't do it, but Alfredo gets on well with the people of the various tribes. Here we've got the Yabuti 
the Vayaro and the Arakapu who come here to work from time to time, and now the Dupari are here too. They all understood a little of the Makarat tongue, that is, so to speak, the lingua fran franca here, just as English is in the outside world. Very few Indians understand Portuguese, and they can't speak it at all properly. There were a thousand more questions on the tip of my tongue, but Ungle was called away on some urgent matter, so I began to clear away my baggage and sorted out what had become damp and moldy on the journey. It was getting on towards evening, and the heat of the day gave way to a pleasant freshness, <clears throat> which now and again sent a pleasing shiver over my sweating body. Then suddenly the outer door opened. A naked Indian came in, armed with bow and arrows. Cautiously he peered about him, and then he came up to me. A second followed him, and then another. A whole crowd thronged through the door and surrounded me. So these were the Tupari Indians. For weeks it had been my one wish to meet these jungle dwellers, and now that they were standing before me, it all seemed so unexpected, so utterly difficult to grasp. Ungle had already sent word to the Indians that a Dutor wished to visit them in their Maloka. Now they had come to have a look at the stranger, a thick-set, burly fellow with a solemn, awe-inspiring expression, came up to me and looked me full in the face. He slapped his chest with the palm of his hand and said in broken Portuguese, Aqui capitodo, I am the chief. Then he placed his hand on my chest and said, with a gesture of inquiry, Aqui, did he want to know my name? Francisco, I replied, feeling as stupid as a schoolboy in an, in an examination. Francisco, Francisco, the chief tried to pronounce my name after me. I laughed agreement, but not a muscle of his face moved. He seemed in no mood for pleasantry, but scanned me with wrinkled brow. I tried to meet his gaze. I was beginning to feel uneasy. Tobacco, the man now said, brusquely and pointed to my baggage. Whenever you meet Indians, offer them something to smoke. That is the first duty of the white man. The missionary bishop at Wahara had warned me. Hastily, I rummaged in my box, and handed the Indian a mojo of tobacco, <clears throat> the bush knife, cigarette papers, and matches. He set to work to cut up the tobacco into thin flakes, rubbed the flakes between his hands, skillfully rolled a cigarette and lit it. The others followed his example. I recovered from my first surprise. These fellows had given me rather a fright when they burst in so suddenly upon me, so now here I was at last among wild Indians. Some looked with unconcealed curiosity at my belongings, which were partly spread out on the ground and lying on the chairs. Others came up to me without any fear, and one even put his arm round my neck in friendly fashion and grinned, Aquibam totobom, thereby expressing his conviction that I was a good fellow. Then they again talked in low tones among themselves in an incomprehensible tongue, pointed to this and that, 
past comments, whispered, and laughed. I did not wish to betray too much curiosity and looked these strange figures up and down only surreptitiously. About twenty had turned up for the visit, many still quite young fellows, while others already showed gray stubble on their chin and upper lip. Nearly all were of small stature, some slim, only a few strongly and massively built. The solemn man who had introduced himself as their leader was alone in wearing trousers. The others went naked, except for a small yellowish leaf which covered the penis. Their noses, lips, and the lobes of their ears were pierced through the nasal septum. They wore a peg as thick as a pencil or a colored stick, which almost blocked the nostrils and made them look even broader. In their lips were stuck thin wooden pegs half the length of a matchstick or two porcupine bristles. Their ears were resplendent with elegant pendants made of small strips of mother-of-pearl and glass beads. A few wore round their middle a string of fine black pearls, but all of them had painted their bodies from top to bottom with long black stripes, wavy lines, and dots. A few young men had the same markings on their faces, only executed more delicately. Their hair was smooth and nearly black. The men parted it in the center. Here and there, one would wear it shoulder length. The younger one had preferred a kind of pony cut. Of eyebrows, beards, or hair on the body, I could see no trace. Meanwhile, the sun had set, but my guest made no move to end the visit. Quite the contrary. They squatted on the ground or on my boxes and stared at me fixedly. How could I entertain them? I cast an eye over my luggage. The radio, yes, why not? I unpacked the set, connected up the battery, and began to turn the knobs. Se va el caimón, se va el caimón, se va a la barranquilla, sounded from the box. A South American station was in the middle of a program of lively dance music, and the effect were immediate. The Indians were fired by an enthusiasm I had not expected. A whispered discussion began. They clustered excitedly round the set and almost crawled inside it in their curiosity. Then they picked up their weapons and began to stamp backwards and forwards in time. I was pleased and beamed no less broadly than the Indians so my radio had found favor with them. Only when darkness began to fall did my naked visitors make themselves scarce. One after the other they vanished. They were probably hungry. Embora, said the burly leader, this was another of the few Brazilian words he had learnt and meant off, and with his bow and arrows he strode solemnly out through the door. You old rascal, I said, but not aloud. Whether you like it or not, you shall nevertheless take me along to your tribe. If only I knew what was going on behind that deadly serious face of yours. I lit my paraffin lamp and struck out at the mosquitoes, which were filling the room with a low buzz. The crescent moon was high in the sky, when Ongol came back, we then took a broad path hacked through the tall jungle to the little settlement which had been set up quite recently, some two kilometers from the river. The Indians and the civilized natives must be kept apart. You have no idea what a bad lot the so-called civilicados are. If there were nothing but Indians here, 
work would be quite a different story. The Kaboklos are the best people in the world as long as they don't come into contact with white and black rogues. We emerged from the forest into a clearing. To the right stretched out a young plantation, and before us there rose, in the pale moonlight, a few large huts. The Tupari were squatting in front of them. A few caboclos were also standing about. We went up the steps to a raised dwelling. A small oil lamp sparsely lighted the interior. Boa Noit, the overseer, said in greeting, Is Alfredo here? A young woman emerged from the semi-darkness. A baby, which looked like a small monkey, was sucking at her breast. He will be here any minute. He's gone to have a quick bath. She said in good Portuguese, Won't you sit down? No, we'll wait outside, said Ongel Boa Noit. Have a look at that woman, he went on in German. She is a pure-blooded Indian, but she doesn't want to be an Indian, but a civilicado. It's just the same with her husband, Alfredo. They both wear their hair short and parted at the side. They will wear only the best materials, drink their cafe zinho every so often during the day like the gentleman in Guajara, and woe betide me if I try to find out anything from them about their Indian past. Even their parents lived like savages, but they talk of them as we might about our ancestors when they still climbed about in trees. And yet, only a few, few years ago, Alfredo took an active part in a great massacre here. I must tell you about it some time. That was when they killed off all the whites in St. Louis. Alfredo had finished his cooling bath and came up from the stream. He was scarcely any different from thousands of other inhabitants of tropical villages, and no one would have suspected him to be the son of a notorious chief. The Dutour wants to go with the Dupari to their Maloka as soon as they go home, began the overseer. Very good, replied the Indian, and stared at me. What do the Tapari think about it? I asked curiously. The naked Indians were listening to our conversation from a distance. The chief stood somewhat apart and seemed either cross or deep in thought. Alfredo exchanged a few words with him in an Indian dialect. What? Did the chief say? I asked him. Nothing, senor. Ongol gave Alfredo a few instructions about the next day's work. It concerned the rice harvest and the production of farina. The rubber gatherers had already begun their task, and the requirements in husked rice and roasted mandioca meal were considerable. We went back to the Barakau. Everyone here calls me Dutour, but I'm not a doctor at all. Here, anyone is called Dutour. If he travels about in the jungle on business not connected with rubber, but on research or for some other unfathomable reason, replied Ongle. By the light of the oil lamp, we talked on until late into the night and drank a bottle of vermouth, which the boss had sent his manager, and the things two Europeans have to talk about when they sit together in the tropic darkness. They may never have met before, but to meet in this solitude makes men companions of destiny. One feels the uncertainty of existence, and suddenly experiences the need to communicate even long-guarded secrets. Perhaps in this way 
we feel something of us will live on if the treacherous jungle should not give us up again. A betrayal of one's confidence is out of the question. One thinks so far from the curious and gossiping multitude does one feel. The yarns of my new acquaintance ranged from his hometown of Biberoc to Hamburg and from there to Para and Manaus. As bookkeeper with the German trading firm of Kohler, he had then moved on to Guajara, but war came. Brazil arrested the German merchants, put them into internment camps, and confiscated their possessions. Ongul made off into the jungle and worked as manager of a baracal on the Rio Corumbayara, and now he has been here on the Rio Branco for two years, hoping to scrape together a small fortune in order to become a civilized person again. The bottle is empty and the lamp is going out. Tomorrow there's another full day's work to be done, said the Swabian in conclusion. The old man knows what he's about in sending a German here. Other rubber kings made millions of cruzeros during the war. The old man was facing bankruptcy then. None of his managers was any good, and now I am supposed to get him out of the wood. Things are looking up, but the struggle has made me ill. We felt chilly. The night had become noticeably cool, but the mosquitoes buzzed tirelessly on. Not even the tobacco smoke had been able to drive them off. We stretched the net over my hammock, and Ongol wished me a good night's rest. Next day, I made the acquaintance of Senor Regino. He was a Brazilian from the state of Minas, with a brown face and crinkly hair like a negro's, which was beginning to turn gray. In his youth, he had come to the Amazon as a ship stoker, and the jungle had suited him better than the towns in the south, and so he finally became a forest dweller, married an Indian woman, and had two children by her. He was not a businessman, for otherwise, with his hard work and his knowledge of the forest, he could have become a rich man. But it was another quality which had made him indispensable in Saloui. He was a friend to the Indians. They respected and honored him like their own father. While the managers in the Baracau were constantly changing, he had always been there as Matiro and foreman and had protected the Indians against the encroachments of the whites. He had become one of them, although he could scarcely understand a word of any Indian tongue. How long will the Tupari remain here? I asked him anxiously. One of these fine days they will disappear, and I shall be left sitting here with my baggage. Don't worry, he laughed. They'll go when I give the word. You can bank on that. We have enough work here for about three weeks. There's still a lot of rice to be harvested, and the new farina hut has scarcely been started. <clears throat> And what do you think about my going to the Tupari all on my own? You needn't worry about that, said Regino. A few years ago, I was there with a caboclo, and they made me very welcome indeed. They killed a few hens and a duck. Apart from that, they have big plantations of maize, manioc, cara, ground nuts, even bananas. There's no need to go hungry there. I had some coffee and sugar with me as well. You see, I don't drink shisha, nor do I eat their concoctions, those caterpillars and grubs, monkey meat and snakes, horrible stuff. But there's no need to eat worms if you don't want to, went on Senor Regino. 
the Tupari know what we have different taste. After all, they've had more than one visit from white people. How many, actually, I interrupted. Oh, that's soon totted up. The first was an employee from the Barakao. He was sent there when no civilized man had yet set eyes on a Tupari. All that was known was that they were friends of the Makarap, who worked with the rubber gatherers over on the Rio Colorado, and who now also do business with Salui. He brought a whole crowd of Tupari with him, but they ran off back into the forest. Next, there was the, the Dutour Alemdo, a German explorer. Senor Ungel knows his name. He went with a whole column of caboclos, and half-savage Indians as far as the Tupari, and he again brought a whole lot of them out of the jungle. In those days, people were frightened of them. The story went that they were savage warriors and cannibals, but fresh labor was needed. The other tribes died out so quickly, the cough had left scarcely any one alive and have the Tapari come here to work of their own accord ever since, quite often of their own accord, but then again they are capable of staying away for two or three years. Once I went out to them and brought them back to do some urgent work, it takes seven or eight days to reach their Malocas. First you go to Tomas Antonio, then to more Yabuti huts, and finally, to the Arikapu. The Arikapu always know the way to the Tapari. They also guided Pedro. That's about three years ago. Pedro, yes, haven't you seen him yet? Senor Eugenio's predecessor sent him to the Tapari to find some labor. We were building the new Baracao here at the time. He was supposed to go there with the writer from Buenos Aires on this occasion, too. Have a word with him for yourself. He is the black man over there roasting farina. Pedro stood by a huge copper frying pan, at least six feet in diameter, and was stirring the coarse whitish mandioca meal with the ladle as big as a paddle. Beside him lay a huge heap of mandioca root, round about squatted a few naked Tupari youths, peeling away in leisurely fashion at the roots with blunt bush knives. They threw the peeled tubers to soak in two long troughs filled to the brim with water. Other youths were turning a kind of mill or mincing machine, the sharp blades of which broke up the tubers into a pulp. You've probably never seen how farina is made. The negro noticed my curiosity. I can't leave this, otherwise it will catch. Over there in the press the pulp is squeezed out. Do you see the juice which is running out? It contains poison. It has to come out, otherwise you can't eat the farina. But I've eaten heaps of mandioca without extracting the poison, I demurred. That is another kind of mandioca, macajira. The Bolivians call it yucca. It is not poisonous, but it's no use for making our farina. It is too sweet. We eat yucca, boiled or roasted, but not as farina. A few Tapari brought more tubers in round baskets and shot them on to the large heap. Do you know these Indians Maloka? I asked the Negro. Oh yes, very well. I was there two years ago, along with Severno. Haven't you met him on the Rio Bronco? Not as far as I know, but how did you get on with the Tapari? Very well, they have a respect for civilized people, 
but we didn't feel quite happy all the time. I believe they still eat human flesh. I saw a pile of bones in a corner of the hut. They weren't the bones of a tapir, nor yet of a wild boar. They were too big to be monkey bones. They can only have been human bones. At all events, I used to go to sleep with a loaded rifle in my arms. You don't know what the devil can happen to you in such a maloka. After all, they are only savages, and if they gobble you up, there's no one to worry about it. You also went out there with the writer from Buenos Aires. The manager wanted me too, but who can possibly go along with a party like that? growled the negro irritably. Ask Regino, the Indians had to tote the heavy baggage and their majest majesties had brought nothing to pay them with. Now, I ask you, they offered Andre a box of matches as his wages for being a porter as if he were a savage. He laughed in their faces. True, he's an Indian, but he's a first-rate rubber gatherer and has more matches than he knows what to do with. Besides, I absolutely refuse to travel in a party where a woman is in charge. So, you didn't get as far as the Tapari this time. No, I was sick and tired of the whole thing. But Joao Tupari and the Arikapu did get the travelers to the Tapari in the end, and now the Indians are complaining. They gave the travelers lots and lots of bows and arrows, and ornaments, and heaven knows what else. And in addition, they carted all their baggage here as well, but got scarcely anything for it. Can you wonder at it if the Indians have now become distrustful? After a short silence, he went on. Besides, further inland than these Tupari, they are said to be a part of the tribe, which still lives completely wild, and further on still lives a tribe, the Quaro, which no white man has ever yet seen. After this, I used to go every evening when work was over, or even in the middle of the day, to the Indian village and sat down with the Tapari in the windowless hut. I always took a small cloth bag containing a few handfuls of banana slices, fried in fat, and passed them round among the Indians. They obviously didn't find them at all bad. Some of the naked men scarcely took any notice of me. Without saying a word, they swung in their hammocks hammocks, or roasted corn cobs or yucca tubers over the little campfires. Others, however, sat down with me in friendly fashion and tried out a few words of Portuguese, which they had picked up during their visits to Sao Luis, but it was hard to make oneself understood. I took out a notebook and fountain pen from my pocket and then they knew what I wanted. I imitated the chief's way of asking me my name. Aqui dato Francisco, I said, and laid the palm of my hand on my chest. Then I pointed to the Indian sitting next to me and asked, Aqui como chama? Amarava came the prompt reply. I noted the word in my book and tried to imitate it. When I succeeded, the Indians drew a deep and audible breath which meant, yes, that's right. I pointed my head. Amarava took his head between his hands and said, Vapaba, Vapaba. I repeated this, and once again the Indians drew a deep breath of confirmation that I had got it right. They laughed. They were enjoying this occupation. And so it went on. Farapapa, Hob, the hare, Vamsi, the nose, 
VEPA, the eye, right down to the toes and toenails. Now I took my comb from my pocket. My language master did not hesitate a second. He took the comb out of my hand and began to comb his hair. This took a good while, for he was very particular. I wonder how long it had been since he had last put a comb through his hair. He was now making up for lost time in earnest, but he was not yet satisfied. He held his open, slightly cut hand before his face and peered attentively into it. Toab Maka, he said, and stretched out his hand to me. I understood that he wanted to have my mirror, to see that he had done his hair properly. I gave him the mirror. I carried in my pocket. Carefully, he inspected himself and made a straight parting. At last, he decided he looked smart enough. His mouth opened out into a broad grin. He handed me back the comb and said, Ampe, that meant comb. Then he gave me back the mirror as well and articulated carefully, Tobe, that then must mean mirror. And so I learned my first words of the language of the Tupari. Many sounds were not easy to imitate and even harder to write down, but it was worth the trouble. It must have been about eight days later that we had a great shock. It was on a Sunday morning, and I was still dozing in my hammock. In the room, or rather the small compartment next to mine, the manager took one leap from his plank bed. Nado, Nado, now, he cried excitedly. I at once stood up. What was wrong? The whole house was swarming with naked Indians. An attack, but surely that was not possible. No, you're, you're not to go away, Claudio. Quickly, fetch Signor Regino, cried Ongo. So, that was what it was. The Tapari were standing there, ready to set off, with their hammocks rolled and their provisions in plated bags. In a trice, Regino was on the spot. A vigorous discussion began. One of the young Indians understood Portuguese well. He acted as spokesman. No, not work. To Pari go away. To Maloka. Here, no good. To Pari hungry. Such was the substance of his arguments. Regino interrupted. You're not to go. Do you hear? The Tapari have always received good pay here. Axes, trousers, shirts, salt, tobacco. First, we will build the Farinha plant. By that time, the boss will come with the motorboat and bring many things for you. Then you can go. Mentira interposed the young Indian and looked very angry. That is a lie. The boss will not come and we shall be working for nothing. There was an embittered exchange of words. Ongol ran excitedly up and down, putting in a word now and then to back up the assurance of Signor Regino. I was no less anxious to see what the outcome of the dispute would be. If the Tapari ran away now, how was I going to fare? I was far from ready to move off. At last, they seemed to reach agreement. Ten men, the chief Vito among them, insisted on going home there and then. The other twenty were willing to stay on and finish off the work which had been begun. The chief now came up to me and looked me full in the face. Aki, chief, go away, Maloka, he said, and looked at me inquiringly. Would I go with him or join the second party? I explained with a few words and a lot of signs that for the time being I would stay, but that I would then come on to his maloka with the other Tapari in order to drink a lot of chicha.
the ten Indians were given some small object as wages, only for the chief did it run to an axe. Then they vanished into the forest, and those who had stayed behind carried back their hammocks to the Caboclo settlement. What's the name of the young fellow who spoke out so boldly for them? I asked Ongle. That was Karumph. He's as sharp as a razor. He is the son of a second chief who is still here. The boss once took this Kurumi as far as Guahara. He is the only Tapari who has seen a white village. He's worked in here in Saloui for a long time, perhaps a year, and understands Portuguese quite well when he wants to. He'd make a first-rate interpreter for me. Just try, Ongle was skeptical. We sat down to breakfast. I made some overtures to Kurum Kurumi, but in vain. The fellow was stubborn. Either he did not understand what was wanted of him, or he mistrusted me and was probably wondering why a stranger should be wanting to know and find out all these things. There was only one other thing to do. I must keep in with his fellow tribesmen, who, to be sure, understood no Portuguese, but showed all the more keenness to teach me their language. As time went on, Kurumi's father, the chief Kwarume, became one of my best teachers. I had been surprised that the little tribe, which had shrunk to about forty families, should have two chiefs, but I learned that, is consist that it consisted of two groups and that each of these groups had its own chief. Vito, this was the name of the serious, dignified chief who had gone on ahead, led the larger group, and Quarume, the smaller. In addition, I soon gathered that each of these groups lived in a large communal hut, and so one day I was sitting with my instructors in their quarters round one of the many small fires. Quarume got up from the improvised stool and brought down from one of the cross beams a mysterious something wrapped in large green leaves and tied up with bast. The Brazilians call these bundles in which meat and other food are stewed on an open fire. Moqueca I sniffed and guessed a small pigeon or some other cooked bird, but what appeared, a large green lizard. Quarume laughed, pulled off a leg from the lizard, and held it out to me. The Indians got up and came closer. Would I really eat some of the lizard? They knew very well that most white men despised such tidbits. I closed my eyes and raised the thing to my mouth, took a bite, swallowed, and behold, the leg of lizard tasted excellent, just like the frog's legs, which we had always consumed at home, with such relish during Lent. The chief offered me another piece. Owe ne? he inquired with satisfaction, and gave me the tail as well. How do you like it? Are you away, I replied with the true ring of conviction. Oh yes, really excellent. I learned another important word during this meal. Hako, that is lizard. Thus my vocabulary increased from day to day. I squatted with the Indians in their little village, passed round tobacco, and cracked Brazil nuts with them. The young fellows grew more and more friendly, and the older ones treated me with a kind of fatherly benevolence. I learned to distinguish their faces and to call them by their names. They were no longer just Indians to me,
but gradually became distinct persons, each with his own individuality. But then, one day, the usual drop of gall fell into my cup of joyful anticipation of adventure in the jungle. I was busy taking some photographs of the Tapari. Suddenly the film would no longer turn, either forwards or backwards. Something seemed to have worked loose and become detached, and was now jamming the whole apparatus. All my turning, pressing, and shaking was to no avail. The camera had become unusable. Only two possibilities were left, either to return from this unusual venture without photographs or to send the camera back to Bolivia for repair. But when would I get it back? In six months, or perhaps a whole year, or even not at all? Who could tell with traveling conditions what they were. Ongol sincerely shared my despair. Indeed, as a good German, he almost felt partly responsible for the breakdown of a German camera, which a Bolivian technician had obviously overhauled all too insufficiently after it had last gone wrong. He advised me, however, not to put off my journey to the Tapari, he would send to Leica to La Paz for repair, then somehow ways and means would be found to forward it to me in the Indian's Maloka. He promised me that I should not become an old man waiting for it. So I accepted my bad luck and continued to cultivate my future companions.